Now we'll ask you to take your Bibles and open them to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we will look at the first three verses. 1 through 3. There we find it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. That's Paul talking to the church of Corinth. He said, By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. May the Lord bless us as we read and study as we're together. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. For I love that old cross, where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. You know, I do truly believe that many of us take for granted, or that is, we fail to properly appreciate just exactly what happened some 2,000 years ago on the hill called Golgotha, where stood that old rugged cross. So with two weeks away from Easter, I... I want us to to go back to the hill. I want us to go back and see exactly what did happen there on that day with the hopes that we'll all come to a greater realization of the fact that we should fear and revere the death of God's Son. So I want us to see five things in regards to the death of God's Son. And the first thing I'll share is that his death was a veritable death. The word veritable means it really did happen. It really did happen. It is not the figment of our imagination. It really did happen. Now, you know, there are skeptics in the world, always have been, always will be. Skeptics about all kinds of things. For example, can you believe this? There are actually some people who believe that NASA did not send man to the moon. They say Hollywood staged this, and that Edwin Aldrin and and, uh, and Armstrong, what was his first name? Neil Armstrong. That they really did not step onto the moon. And there are people who are skeptics and say it really did not happen. You know, there are people who say that Elvis Presley did not die in 1977. They'll say there were Elvis sightings in numerous and various places afterwards. But but what about his body that lay corpse in the casket? You see, they're skeptics. They're they're people that just can't believe anything. And and I'll tell you, when it comes to the crucifixion, there are people just like that as well. For you know, we go all the way back into the Bible times, all the way back to biblical times. There we find as we've been studying recently on Wednesday nights, there was a group of people called the Gnostics. And these were false teachers, John told us about. They were going around teaching a false doctrine. They were saying that this man named Jesus was born and grew to become a man at age 30. And that all of a sudden, the Son of God came down from his throne in heaven when he was being baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, and that the Son of God came down and came upon this man named Jesus and empowered him. Thus then we see in his three years of ministry how he was able to feed the multitudes and how he was able to walk on water and calm storms and heal people who were sick and raise the dead. That, that's what they said. And then they said, that, and they taught this erroneous doctrine that when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, that the Son of God departed this man named Jesus. 
And that it was just a mere human man who died on the cross. And that, this, because they say, the Son of God could not die. Well, I want to tell you something. That is baloney theology. That is not true. There, you know, there are other religions. Um, other religions, you know, for example, other cults. Jehovah's Witnesses say that Jesus died, but he wasn't crucified on a cross. They say he was impaled on a, on a torture, this long thing where they would torture people by impaling them on just a pole is what it was called. And they say, though, that he did not rise from the dead. They say he remained dead. And then there are other groups like the Muslims. The Muslims, they have different factions within them who believe different things. And one, one group of Muslims believe that Jesus never died. That God just supernaturally and incredibly raptured him on up into heaven. Just very similar to like he did Elijah and to Enoch. That he just translated him on up. That's what one group says. Another group says, no, they, 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 the man tried to make it appear as though he died on the cross, but instead what they did is they took his body down from the cross and then they got him out of town and he continued to preach the gospel in India until old age and died of natural causes. I want to tell you something. If people deny the crucifixion, they are denying the heart of the gospel. If anyone says Jesus did not die on the cross, then they have no hope. Our hope in life, our hope of eternal life, lies fully and totally and completely in the fact that Jesus walked up the Via della Rosa. He walked up the hill. He laid down upon that cross and he died. For our sins. But he didn't remain dead. He rose from the dead. Don't want to get too far ahead though. I'll talk about that next week. And then the Easter cantata. So we are, we're, we're going back to the hill though. Right now. I want to see what happened. On that cross. It was a veritable death. Meaning that it really did happen. You see God's word is the standard. And although mankind, uh, groups of mankind, may be skeptical about things like this, God's word is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. It is the standard. It is what we believe. And it says in Romans 5 eight, but God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In Philippians 2.8, it says that Jesus came, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He had to die. He had to die because of the penalty for our sins that had to be paid. It says in Romans 6, 23, that the wages or the penalty of sin is death. So someone or something had to die to atone for our sins. For it says in Hebrews 9.22, that almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. But also I stand here to say that the Bible reveals to us that there is not an animal in all this world, not a cow, not a bull, not a lamb, not a goat, no animal that can be killed and sacrificed on any altar there in the temple in Jerusalem, then no, anytime, anywhere, no animal can atone for our sins. Its blood is not sufficient. It had to be the Son of God. It had to be the Son of God. Hebrews 9.12 says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. His death was a veritable death. That is, it really did happen. Then I will tell you that his death was a voluntary death. Jesus was not murdered. He was not killed. Did everyone hear me on that? He died voluntarily. 
He was not murdered. I'll repeat it. He was not murdered. He was not killed. Contrary to what many believe. Some would argue that and say, well, what about the Roman crucifixions? Did not the Romans crucify people? Yes, they did. Until the Roman Emperor Constantine ended that around 4 AD. Otherwise, the Romans did crucify people, especially those who were really, really bad criminals and uh, done really bad things, such as murders or even insurrections against the Roman Empire. And that especially, yeah. They did not like insurrections against the Roman Empire, which is the very thing what the people wanted Jesus to, be, to do as a messianic king, as a Davidic type king, as a warrior king, when he was coming riding into Jerusalem on the back of the donkey, they wanted him to rebel against the Romans. And he didn't come to do that. He came in peace, not to declare war against the Romans. But yeah, the Romans did crucify people. And they did that as a deterrent to crime. For They did it publicly. Whoever committed a terrible crime, they would strip them of all clothing and hang them before everyone to look at and see in utter shame and embarrassment, hanging out for everyone. And it was a very brutal, brutal execution. So bad that they did that as a deterrent to crime and insurrections. Well, did not the soldiers hammer the nails that we read about in the Bible? Yes, they did. They hammered the nails. Then how can I stand here? How can I, how can I stand here then and say that it was a voluntary death when the Romans crucified him and the soldiers hammered the nails? How can I say that? Because I look into the Bible, and again, like I said, it's my standard. It is what I go by. And Jesus himself said in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. He did not say, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd's life will be taken. He said, I give my life. First John three sixteen says, Hereby we perceive the love of God, because that he sent his only begotten Son into the world. And laid himself down, hereby perceived with the love of God, because he laid himself down for us. He laid himself down for us. He laid himself down upon the tree, upon the cross. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, in the shadow of the cross, this is what happened when they, the soldiers came in to arrest him. <clears throat> when they came in to arrest him, and put him in the shackles as though he were a hardened criminal. Yeah, they did that. Peter reacted in a bit of rage as he took his sword out and chopped off the ear of a Roman soldier. And Jesus said, no, Peter, no violence. Stop it. Jesus healed that Roman soldier's ear, restored it. And Jesus looked at Peter, and he looked at those other disciples, and he said this to them. In Matthew 26, 53, So thinkest thou not that I cannot now call and pray unto my Father in heaven, and he shall not presently give me more than, more than 12,000 legions of angels. In a Roman legion, there were 6,000 soldiers. You do the math, 12 times 6, that's 72,000 angels. And he said more than that. He said, I can call thousands and thousands and thousands of angels down right now, from out of heaven, to deliver me from this arrest by the Roman soldiers and prevent me from being scourged and prevent me from having to be crucified. He said, I could have done that. But then Matthew 26, 54 says, but then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that this, thus, this must be. This must be. He died voluntarily on the cross to keep us out of hell if we'd receive him as Savior. March 24th of 1996, that's a long time ago, is on an Easter Sunday. I was in Traveler's Rest. 
And the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night. I never forget it. And the Lord impressed upon my heart to get up out of bed and get a piece of paper and a pen and write something down. I'm not real big into writing poems and stuff like that. Occasionally I do. I enjoy things like that some, somewhat. But I don't do it often. But the Lord told me what to put down. And I shared this that morning on Easter Sunday at that church in Traveler's Rest back in 1996. This is what it says. Did he bleed to death with nails in his hands? How did he die? Did he bleed to death with nails in his hands? He died of a broken heart. Did his lungs collapse as he hung on the cross? He died of a broken heart. Did he die because of the sword in his side? He died of a broken heart. Did they stab him with a knife? Did they shoot him with a gun? Did they pierce him with a spear? Did they stone him with a rock? Did they burn him at the stake? No, he died of a broken heart. What was the cause of death? It was a broken heart. Then why? How so? What made it break? Was it Peter? Was it Judas? Was it the crowd? Who's the guilty party? Who is the guilty party? Who made it break? The answer is us. That's you and me. Because of our sins, because of our iniquities, he died of a broken heart. For all the times we don't go to church, he died of a broken heart. For all the times we, we don't read the word, he died of a broken heart. For all the times we never pray, neglect the witness, and fail to worship, he died of a broken heart. Why the fuss? Why was it so? Why was he concerned for people like us? Why would our sins make his heart break? The reason is simple. The answer is clear. It's all because he loves us. What's the cause of Jesus' death? Was it dehydration? Was it exposure? Was it loss of blood, asphyxiation, that is suffocation? No, he died of a broken heart. And it was all voluntary. Not only was it a veritable death, really did happen, voluntary, he laid himself down upon the cross, was not murdered, was not killed, he voluntarily died for us. It was a vicarious death. And the word vicarious means substitute. He died personally on the cross so we wouldn't have to. Again, Romans 5, 8 says, but God committed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, Christ his own self bore our sins, our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins might live unto righteousness. He did that for us. And again, in the latter part of verse 3, in our text this morning that I read, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. <clears throat> now think about Abraham and Isaac. When God told Abraham to slay your son Isaac, it was a test to see if Abraham would obey. And Abraham was passing the test as he went on top of that mountain. He had the, the knife ready to carry it through to do what God told him to do. But God never intended on him to kill his son. And God stopped him, abruptly stopped him from stabbing his son to death on the altar. And it says in Genesis twenty-two thirteen that Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his sons. I'll come on someone and say amen. And then we see that when Jesus was coming down the hill for his baptism by John the Baptist preacher, the preacher looked up from that river and he saw him and said, as it says in John 1, 29, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He was coming to be the substitute lamb. The substitute lamb. 
to take our place. It was a vicarious death. Then, it was a very vicious death. As we go back to the hill 2,000 years ago, let us get into the crowd. Let us look and see what they're observing. Let us hear the cursing of the people that are around him, who just before had said, Hosanna, blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. But when he was not going to be that messianic, Davidic type king, they quickly turned on him. Many of them were cursing at him. The religious leaders, they're at the foot of the cross too, and they're just hysterically laughing at him and mocking him. Even the soldiers are gambling over his clothing. We see that. Everybody see it? We're at the cross. Let's, let's imagine we're there, and the soldiers are gambling over his clothes, and we see Jesus on that cross, blood pouring. It tells us he was beaten before that, in Isaiah 53, 5, the prophet prophesied many hundreds of years before it ever even happened. He said, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. In John chapter 19, 17 and 18, it says, he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him crucifixions. As I said, you know, that was the most brutal way to kill a man. Although Jesus wasn't killed, don't take me wrong, he voluntarily died. His life was not taken. But still, nonetheless, people were killed on the crosses. They were impelled with stones, I mean with, uh, with nails, I should say, with nails. Rusty, old rusty nails. They were impaled onto the cross. The way they would do it is they lay the cross down and nail the person to that tree and lift them up. His legs would be slightly bent and he could not breathe. And so with a nail through his feet, with one foot on top of the other foot, a nail hammered through it, think about it. To be able to breathe, he had to stand up and all that pressure on those feet with the nail through him. And all the while, after he had been scourged so badly in the beating, his raw back would be rubbing against that splintered wood of that cross. Can you imagine that? He'd gasp for breath, and then he cannot continue in that way, so he has to go back down. And then that raw back rubbing yet again against the splintered wood as it goes down. Up and down. A crucifixion would, would not be a fast death either. Believe it or not, it, would be a, it was a slow death. And uh, it would take sometimes as much as four days before a person would die. Sometimes they would break the legs of the criminal to speed up the death. Crucifixions in Rome had started, well, they they'd started in biblical times, I should say, back when King Darius was the king of Persia. In 519 B.C., when he impaled 3,000 of his enemies in Babylon on, a cross, on crosses. And they had been going along on for a long, long time to be a deterrent to crime. But Jesus had done no, nothing wrong. He's the innocent Lamb of God. And... You know, I just to give you a little bit greater appreciation, I got this off the internet. I want you to listen to this. It says, when a person being crucified, usually the victim would then be forced to carry his own crossbeam to the place of execution. Once there, the executioners would affix the victim and the crossbeam to a tree or wooden post. Sometimes before nailing the victim to the cross, a mixture of vinegar, gall, and myrrh was offered to alleviate some of the victim's pain. It was offered to Jesus, but he refused. Because he was, going to, he was willing to suffer the full blunt of our, what we deserved. And that is everyone who's ever lived, is living now or ever will live. Wooden planks were usually fastened to the vertical stake as a footrest or seat allowing the victim to rest his weight and lift himself for breath, thus prolonging suffering and delaying death for up to three days. 
and supported the victim would hang entirely from nail-pierced wrists. And they would put the nails through the wrist, not the hand, so that it wouldn't rip through the hand. Severely restricting breathing and circulation. The excruciating ordeal would lead to exhaustion, suffocation, brain death, and heart failure. At times, mercy was shown by breaking the victim's legs, causing death to come more quickly. As a deterrent to crime, crucifixes were carried out in highly public places with the criminal charges posted on the cross above the victim's head. After death, the body was usually left hanging on the cross. Of course, it couldn't hang on the Sabbath day. And that's why they broke the soldier's legs when Jesus was on the cross because the Sabbath day was coming and, and a body could not be hanging on the cross. And so they came to, and noticed that he was already dead. They didn't have to break his legs because he died of a broken heart. So then usually after three or four days of hanging there in public display for everyone to see one who was crucified, then a family were to come, even though they're in absolute shame that their loved one is a criminal and died in that way. But if any family came and gave them a proper burial, they would otherwise, the Roman government would take the body off the cross and throw it into the Valley of Hinnom, which was a perpetual fire. In other words, it was a burning trash heap. That's where they would throw them. Thank God. Joseph of Arimathea offered his tomb for Jesus, the Son of God, to have a proper burial before his resurrection. And that brings me to my last point. Hey, listen, it doesn't end in sadness. This story, the true story of the death of God's Son, has a good ending. It has a good ending. Listen, hang on with me, because... Not only was it a veritable death, a voluntary death, a vicarious death, and a vicious death, it also was a victorious death. When Jesus breathed his last breath on that tree, it was not defeat, it was rather a victorious trouncing of the evil one, the despicable one, the nasty one, the horrible one, the hateful one, that is the red dragon, the old the hurry, sorry, good-for-nothing devil. In John 19, 30, Jesus said, it is finished. And when he said, it is finished, he was saying, what my mission, what I came to do has been accomplished. Before he had died on the cross, he had told his disciples in John 12, 32 and 33, and I, if I be lifted up, don't be confused about that if I, because many times in the King James Version, the word if actually means when. So when he said, if I be lifted up, he was saying, when I be lifted up, that is on the cross, I will draw all men unto me. Does that preach universal salvation? Absolutely not. What he was talking about, when I am lifted up on the cross, then whosoever lives in all of this world who will come to me to receive me can and will be saved. Amen. Not everyone does come to him, but all who do, the door is wide open. And then... In John, 1 John 4, 1, uh, 9, he say, it says, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God lay, uh, sent his only begotten Son that we might live through him. John three seventeen says, For God uh, sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He came to offer salvation, and that salvation, that atonement, could not happen but by his grace and mercy through his sacrificial death on the cross. Now, in conclusion, let me just say, when we think about the death of God's Son, all that I have shared should have sent a chill down our spine. When we read about it, we ought to be moved with fear. We ought to be shaken to the core when we think about what Jesus went through for us. Oh, but pastor, it's so long ago. So many other things have happened since. It's just, I don't think about it anymore. Really? 
He went through that for us, for us to just casually forget. Shame on us. We ought to all get down on our knees and beg for him to forgive us. And we need to start dwelling on and thinking about what he did for us on the tree at Calvary. And we ought to be shaken to the inner core and moved with fear and reverence. We should fear the death of God's Son. Let us pray.